بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين أما بعد All praise is due to Allah who created man from clay the master and owner of judgment day Allah who knows what we conceal and knows what we reveal and what leaves may fall and what the animals feel. And upon his messenger we ask his salah and his praise and we ask to remain steadfast until the end of our days. Amma Ba'd, we're supposed to speak about the forbidden love and uh, I don't know why I was given this lecture and in retrospect I now re regret it. But when we say the forbidden love, obviously we're talking about the forbidden type, but which, what is, which one is the one that is forbidden? And definitely you know the answer, it would be a love relationship that is outside of marriage. And the reason being is that Islam came to protect your chastity, it came to protect the lineage of people, and it came also to prevent zina, which are illicit sexual relations between a man and a woman. And the ill effects of a sexually loose society are many. And if you st ever study what are the effects of having a society that's sexually loose, you'll find so many things directly and indirectly related to the society being loose in that sense. From crime, it can be related to zina, con men in the society, serial killers. If you, look, if you study the life of serial killers, you'll find most of them were children of zina who their mothers were young and they didn't bond with them. Ted Bundy, a ex uh, famous example and others. You can also link homosexuality to having a sexually loose society. And more zina is linked to zina. A statistic says that 82% of teenage mothers are themselves the daughters of teenage mothers. 82%. So all these issues come from zina and zina obviously is part of the the, yani it's a relationship outside of marriage and it's a forbidden relationship. So then the question is, is Islam against love? Because many people don't hear much, many lectures about love in Islam or romance in Islam. And they don't hear much about love in Islam. So I remind you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of his names is Al-Wadud. The loving and the one that is beloved also. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala many times in the Quran tell us the types of the types of people that He loves. Inna Allah yuhibbu tawabin wa yuhibbu mutatahirin. Inna Allah yuhibbu ladina yuqatiluna fi sabilihi safa. Wa huwa al ghafur al wadud. So, so many times Allah will mention the types of people that He loves and He will mention love and how He is, mentioned, how he is loved by His servants. And those of you who have studied, um, you know, in worship, you, will, you may have encountered something called the three pillars of worship, which is love, hope, and fear. What drives you to worship? Part of it is fear of the punishment. Part of it is hope in Allah's mercy. But then, as the scholars describe it like a bird, the body of that bird, if the wings to keep it balanced are love and fear, the body of the bird is the love, uh, hope and fear, the wings. The body of the bird is the love that drives you forward. So. Loving Allah Azza wa Jal and, and worshipping Him out of love is part of it as well. So there is a lot of love in Islam, whether or not you have uh, sat at a lecture where it was just about love. The Prophet Sallallahu was a very loving person and also very romantic. Uh, a lot of people think that to be religious you have to be dry and emotionally distant and just frowning. And that's the mark of a good religious person. You see a good religious brother is like this. Assalamu alaikum, alhamdulillah, Allah barak fi. This is a good, serious, mashallah, good religious brother. But no. So, and there's nothing shameful about love. Contemplate the hadith of Amr ibn al-As when he came to ask the Prophet Sallam, which of the people is most beloved to you? Now if I ask you this question, what is the, which of the people is most beloved to you? And, I, and I'm talking outside your family, what will you say? Oh, Sheikh so and so. Who will just immediately run and say, my wife? But the Prophet Sallam when Abu ibn al-As asked him, who is, who is the most beloved to you of people? Immediately he says, Aisha. So Abu ibn al-As had to clarify, well, I was talking about men, not women. So the Prophet Sallam is not ashamed to say that he loves his wife in public. And 
the Prophet had يعني, excellent love for Khadija radiallahu anha that remained even after her death, even years after her death. He loved her so much that he would honor her friends and her relatives years after her death. He would pre present them with gifts. If he slaughtered, he would give part to them. And Aisha radiallahu anha said she had never been jealous of anyone as much as she was jealous of Khadija radiallahu anha, who died many years before her. And the Prophet also uh, would mention about loving children, where he, when he kissed a child and the man asked him, he said, you kiss children? I have so many kids and I've never kissed one of them. And the Prophet tells him, what can I do for you if Allah has taken mercy out of your heart? So there's a lot of love. And in, uh, in the hadith recorded in Sahih al-Jami'ah, the Prophet ﷺ said, there is nothing better for two who love one another than marriage. The two who love one another, the best thing for them is to get married. So the, it does acknowledge that there can be love and then it gives you a solution for it, which is the marriage. It recognizes that. So then what does the forbidden love do? It causes zina. It causes people to lose their religion. And it also replaces the love of Allah with the love of that individual. So now someone is probably saying, great, now our favorite thing, love, now, now they're telling us it's forbidden as well. And how are we supposed to get married? No love, how are we going to get married here? So let me ask you a question. Which do you think of these two groups I'm about to mention, which is the more successful type of marriage? The type of marriage where people fell in love before getting married or the type of love where people fell in love after marriage? Who thinks the, the more successful one is, well, don't be shy, Ani. If you fell in love before marriage, this is a more successful marriage. Okay, so we have three brothers and just one sister on this side. Okay, four brothers now. And 50 who are like... Okay, so... And who thinks that? Obviously the rest, I will assume, they think that the other type, the, the, where the love happens after marriage is the more successful, and you are correct. So contrary to what we think, you fall in love first, chocolates, flowers, roses, then you get married, nice happy life. But statistics will tell you that those who fell in love after marriage, that's the more successful type of wedding. But let me ask you one more. Do you think which is the type of marriage that's more successful? The one where you find your own spouse or the one where your best friend's wife hooks you up with some other sister and, or your mother or your sister hooks you up with someone? Who says the first type where you find your own spouse? Put your hand up. Okay. And this is the second. And who has no clue what we're talking about? Okay, and the truth is the second type where someone hooks you up with someone, where there's a hookup. They tell you this person, that person, and then this is the more successful type of marriage. So it goes contrary to what we usually think. And why is it that it's usually the opposite? Because we live in a world of exaggerated romance. And coming from Sudan, being very unromantic myself, I'm the right person to speak about exaggerated romance. Everything is full of so much romance. And by the way, there are studies by, by Western scholars on this issue. That it's too much and it's unrealistic, the type of romance we hear about in the movies. It's un exaggerated romance. In the books, the romantic novels with the guy with the long hair or Ma'arif Ish on the cover. Exaggerated. And in the music, and of course music, not only does it exaggerate romance, but most of the time it's praising. When music talks about love, is it talking about uh, yani the wife? Yeah, anyone, Puff Diddy talks about, I love you, ma'arif ish. Is he talking about his wife? He's talking about some foreign woman. They're always talking about zina, mostly, fornication. So, the exaggerated romance is what makes now people have this unrealistic view in their head. It's all this stuff we're talking about, that you had me at hello type of stuff. Huh? The soulmates kind of uh, action. You know, the prince that will sweep, sweep you off your feet. All of this is just exaggerated romance. And it's unrealistic and it makes people live in this type of dream, dream world where this is their expectation for their marriage. And it could be something as unromantic as a brother bringing his father with a broken accent and they're sitting and they're talking to your father who has a broken accent. Oh, we want your son to marry our daughter. That's it. No flowers, no roses, no prince on a white horse. Khalas. But it might be a very nice relationship after that. Taib. So there are so many problems that are caused by love relationships that are outside of marriage. The least of them is the person who becomes a zombie who can't think about anything but the person that they're in love with. I know one brother who had a famous love story in our area. He's in love with this sister for three years. We were at the Ikna or Isna convention some years ago. We prayed 
After the salah, after the taslim, he tells me, Wallahi, during the whole prayer, I'm just thinking of her. So now, okay, no focus on salah, forget about Allah, just all he's thinking about is the sister, the sister, the sister, the sister. So this is the worst case, the least case is that you'll just become like that, a mindless zombie. You can't think straight. But the reality is we have so many horror stories when it comes to uh, love relationships. And if, if these stories were about people who didn't pray and things of that sort, it wouldn't be scary. But the reality is many of the people we consider to be good brothers and sisters have fallen into these things. So many times I get emails from sisters who are active in da'wah, for example, who will say, I started giving da'wah to some, to some young man and now I'm emotionally attached to him. Or a brother who will start giving da'wah and then they will become emotionally attached as well. And stories of pregnancies from re the religious people. Yani. These things happen. And there is a tension between men and women. So, so you can't expect that you can mingle with, with women and sisters will mingle with men and that nothing will happen. Because that's not true. Because there is a tension that naturally occurs, occurs between men and women. Uh, there is a, there's a story they say about, uh, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can come back to that. But uh, there, a story narrated by uh, Ibn al-Jawzi, rahimahullah, in his book Al-Muntadham. He says that there, at some point in history, the Muslims had surrounded a room, the, the Europeans, in a fort, a very strong fort of theirs. So they put it under siege and they stayed there for a long time. He says one of those days, one of the women, one of the European women, she peered over the wall of the fort and one of the Muslims, his name is, is Ibn Abdul Rahim, he saw her, so he became attracted to her. So he, t he asked her, he said, كيف السبيل إليك? He says, how do I get to you? So she says, there is no way for you to get to me except if you become a Christian. And if you become a Christian, I will, so I will show you a secret passage so you can come into the fort. So the man, he fell so in love with this woman that he became a Christian even though he was now in the middle of jihad and he was a hafiz of the Qur'an but he became in love you know, and it took over his heart and his thinking and his emotions so he became a Christian and he went to her the Muslims were very saddened when that happened and the siege continued for a long time and eventually the Muslims left that fort and, and some while later a group of Muslims passed by the same fort and they remembered Ibn Abdul Rahim so they start to call to him, Ya Ibn Abdul Rahim, Ya Ibn Abdul Rahim. So he looked over the, the, the wall of the fort. So then they asked him, You got what you wanted. So where is your Quran? And where is your knowledge? And what happened? What ha and what has your prayer done for you? So he began to cry. And he said to them, Wallahi, I have forgotten all of the Quran. And I do not remember except one ayah. And that is the ayah where Allah Azza wa Jal says, "Rubama yawaddu al-ladina kafaru law kanu muslimin." Perhaps that the non-believers will wish that they were Muslims. This is the only ayah that he remembered. But so many people, when they become in love, they think that the root of their happiness lie, lays in getting to be with that person that they're يعني, so attached to. But these similar stories have happened today. There was one brother who uh, he became, uh, he started practicing Islam, he became active in da'wah. And then one day, some old female acquaintance who is a non-Muslim calls him up. So she says, it's been a long time and so on and so forth. He says, uh, he says I would like to come see you. She says, well, now I'm a Muslim and I'm a practicing Muslim and uh, I'm not able to see you. She says, I'll just pass by, we'll just talk in the car. So she came, he went down, they were talking in the car. She said, I'll just drive around. They start driving around and now he's, you know. So then they stopped in front of a place. She said, this is my house. Why don't you just come in? So now he wants to test himself. So they went, they went inside. The end of the story is that, at the end of the story, بالله, they, they, يعني, they committed zina. And the thing was right after they committed zina, and they got up, she looked, at, she looked at him and she said, Huh, Islam, huh? As an insult to, to the injury now. But a lot of brothers do this and a lot of sisters do this. They test their iman. They test their iman. I will give da'wah to the prettiest girls in the school and inshallah nothing will happen to my iman. People always test their iman and test themselves. Like people who pray with the television on. Let me test my khushu'ah. Allahu Akbar. 
and they start testing themselves. People do this in so many ways. Monitor your, your, yourself. You'll see. Oh, there is some danger in that, but inshallah, nothing will happen. Let me see what will happen. Let me ask you this. Do you test your life? Do you say, let me run across the busy highway and see if I have my life when I get to the other side? Because you value it, you don't put it to the test. You value your iman, why do you put it to the test? Well, let me talk to give the sisters da'wah and see what happens. By the way, in our, in our da'wah table at our MSA, we have a group of sisters on one side, a group of brothers on one side. Guess who comes to the brothers to ask them about Islam? Jessica and Kimberly and Edwina, Ma'arif Ish. And who comes to the sisters to ask them about Islam? Chad and Brad and, and all those guys. So what do we do? We do a quick switch. Because don't, don't be fooled, I'm working for Allah. So many times something starts out good and the shaitan turns it sour at the end. So we do the quick switch. Now this is Jessica, she wants to learn about Islam. I introduce her to another sister and that's the end of that. Then there's also the famous excuse that the hearts are pure and the intentions are good. And therefore, if I'm telling someone about Islam with good intentions, it's not a problem. And that may be the case initially, but you never know when something sour will creep into it. And for that reason, you find the companions of the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ himself would not put themselves in situations like that, though they had the best of intentions and the purest of hearts. One sheikh was telling about um, a young man who who dialed the wrong number and found this girl. She had a sweet voice over the phone. So they fell in love. You know, he talks to her and she's talking to him with a sweet voice and everything. So they fell in love over the phone. They've never met. And of course, this is not a, a proper relationship. And uh, no one was involved, no wellies, no anything. Just him and her, you know, uh, as they say, macking on the phone. You know, I know about macking because I'm Kam Kamal al Maki, you know. <laughs> so... So what happens? He tells her, I want to meet you one day. And they meet with no mahram in the street. And she wears naqab, so when they met, she uncovered her face and he saw that she was, I'm sorry sisters, but this is a reality, she was very ugly. <laughs> so she was so ugly that he couldn't help himself, he naturally said, A'udhu Billah, what kind of a... <laughs> he said, A'udhu Billah, what kind of a face is that? Guess what she responded to him with? She said, well, beauty is not important. The most important thing is akhlaq. <laughs> akhlaq? You're meeting a guy you've never met over the phone in the street somewhere without a mahram. You're talking about akhlaq? <laughs> so, <laughs> طيب. so then we, we, we talk about one of the dangers of the forbidden love is that it may lead to zina. And wallahi, I just hope that you will trust me enough so I don't have to get, give you details of things that happen within Muslim or any organizations such as MSAs about illicit sexual encounters between men and women. Let's just not get into the details and accept the fact that this is reality that it happens. It happens because the barriers break eventually between the brothers and sisters. First of all, alaikum sister. The brother is not so far looking down that he's looking that way. Alaikum <laughs> salam sister. Allah After a while you get used to it. Ah, sister, listen, where you had the... You get used to it after a while. So, uh, now but then zina, which is fornication, a strong word now, it's even given nice euphemisms that make it sound very nice. No one says, well, uh, we know, the, your non-Muslim friends don't say we committed fornication. They say what? We made love. Ya salam. They sat down, they made little hearts, they tied bows. <laughs> Everyone have a heart. We made love. We slept together. It was so innocent. She went over there, went over there, everybody slept. <laughs> Wake up in the morning, good morning. <laughs> Slept again. Euphemism. Something wicked, give it a nice word. It makes it more acceptable to people. Allah Azza wa Jal says about zina in the Quran, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا الزِّنَا إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاحِشَةً وَسَاءَ سَبِيلًا And do not come close to zina, that it is a, a, a great sin and an evil way. Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about, also describing the believers, وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخر. And those who do not call upon other gods besides Allah, وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ وَلَا يَزْنُونَ And they do not kill the soul which Allah has made sacred, except with a just cause, and they do not commit zina. وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ يَلْقَى أَثَامَ يُضَاعَفْ لَهُ الْعَذَابُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ And whoever does that, he will meet his punishment, and, it will, and the punishment will be doubled for them on the day of resurrection. 
The Prophet ﷺ then also in, in Sahih al-Bukhari describes that the fornicator is not a believer when he commits fornication. And other narrations would explain that the, that the iman leaves the person while they're fornicating and it comes back to them while they're, when they're done. And that's why they are suddenly overcome with the extreme feeling of guilt when they're done. طيب. So then the question is this. We looked at the ayah that I first mentioned. Allah Azza wa says, وَلَا تَقْرَبُ الزِّنَا because we're not only going to be talking about preventing zina, because no one, look, Allah Azza wa says, وَلَا تَقْرَبُ الزِّنَا Do not come near zina. He didn't say, do not commit zina. Please pay attention to this. Allah didn't say, do not commit zina. He says, do not come near zina. Let me ask you this. Who wakes up suddenly, who is unconscious and suddenly wakes up in the middle of, of the act of zina? No one ever in the history of the world. No one suddenly wakes up in the middle of zina. Why? There are steps that lead to it. Someone give us examples of things that lead to zina? How does it start? Yani if some non-Muslim somewhere has the intention to make zina, how does he start? Yes, sir. Okay, being alone. But even before being alone, he doesn't suddenly imagine and he's alone. Yes? Naam? Lust. Okay. Looking. Excellent. Sisters? Naam? Okay. All these things are things that lead to zina. So now realistically in Islam, when Allah prohibits something, He prohibits things that lead to it. It doesn't tell you, well, go ahead, get right to the doorstep, but stop there. It will block the road that will take you to that doorstep. This is how it works. Kind of like the example with alcohol, so people understand. So Allah has made consuming alcohol and getting drunk haram, right? So then He made things that lead to you getting drunk haram, such as selling it. Selling the alcohol is per forbidden. Buying the alcohol is forbidden. Carrying, physically carrying the alcohol is forbidden. Sitting down with people who drink, it's forbidden. So all these things lead to you getting drunk. They've become haram. It makes it more logical now. Compare that to in Christianity where you're allowed to drink but not to get drunk. So how many people say you know, they're drinking, they're like, oh, I think I'm about to get drunk. Let me desist. You know what really happens? The reality, alcohol is, is a substance that alters your judgment. So how on earth are you supposed to drink something that alters your judgment and then suddenly make a judgment that you've had enough? It doesn't work like that. So then the same thing with fornication. You're not supposed to fornicate. So then everything that will lead to that has been made prohibited. So you look at things that will eventually lead to, pro, pro, to uh, yeah, any fornication. It begins with the look. You know, you have to obviously... Uh, look at the, see the person first so it begins with the look the smile the talk the being alone the touch the zina you don't just get into the zina the things that go before that and like I said يعني, our main uh, goal here is not just to talk about uh, preventing zina but we're talking about the steps that will lead to it and I want to focus on those the two main culprits then would be the intermingling that I want to talk about intermingling and the gaze, the looking at women, and intermingling. So when it comes to intermingling, uh, for some reason people have used it to, to say, well, this is a type of extremism. You, you go to an event, the men and women are sitting together, you say, you must have the men on one side, the women on one side. Someone says, that's a little extreme. You know, why, why are you being extreme? We're here at an Islamic event, and the hearts are pure, and the intentions are good, and all that stuff. So now let's, let's understand something very important here about what is extreme and what is not. Within any realm, within any ideology, within any religion, there are typically two extremes. There's one extreme end and there's the other extreme end. Within Islam and your behavior, there can be one extreme end and another extreme end. So if I were to ask you, who is the middle, what would you say? The Prophet ﷺ is the middle. No one will dare say he was in this extreme end or the other extreme end. He was moderate, he was in the middle. Sahih? So now we look at what the Prophet ﷺ did. If what we're doing is below, is less than what he did, that means we're moving to this extreme. And if what he, we're doing is more than what he did, we're moving to the other extreme. It's that simple, you see. Because now people use extremism for everything. Like uh, we had uh, a brother, a friend of ours, he used to work as a bouncer for three years in front of a nightclub. A bouncer. This is before he became practicing. So he stays until 3 a.m. in front of this nightclub and he's supposed to, and he, you know, so people come with knives, with switchblades, with guns, and that's his job for three years. And no one, his parents never said, you know, this is that other extreme end. So then he started to become practicing 
and he would stay with us at our Islamic center. Sometimes we'd have a late uh, kebab dinner until he'd go home by midnight. His parents now were like, are we worried for you, Akhi? you're staying until midnight with these people. They were never worried when he used to be a bouncer and come home 3 a.m. But now they're worried because this type of extremism, that, which they think is extremism, but the other life, they didn't look at it as extremism. There are two families, one is practicing, the other is, is getting drunk. They don't say, well, this one is extreme. They warn the one who is practicing, don't become extreme. So this is something that we have that's incorrect. With extremism, we look at the middle, the Prophet ﷺ. If we're doing less than him, you're going to that extreme end. If you're doing more than what he used to do, you're doing extra things and making it difficult, you're going towards the other extreme end. So it comes to intermingling. Every time you tell people, separate the men and the women, you're being extreme. What's going to happen? Yani? Uh, and, and most sins, they start off innocent. And most sins, they start off with good intention. Just like we said, with the people who give da'wah, they start off giving da'wah, something good. And then emotions and feelings creep into it, and then it becomes sour. You have probably heard of the, the story of the, um, of the past nations. A man, he was uh, a abid and a salih. He was a righteous man and a worshiper of Allah. And then there were three brothers who wanted to go on a journey. So they thought, and they had a sister. They thought the best place was to leave their sister with this man, who is a, a worshiper and no, known for his righteousness. So they asked him, and he said, I can't leave her with me. So they built her a place next to him, a, a shelter, and she would stay in that room, never leaving. So they left on their journey, and they went out for a, over a year. So in the beginning, the... He, the shaitan came to him and, he's, and he told, tells him something that's possibly correct. He said, you know, haram, the lady's alone and, you know, she may feel sick and she, she has no one to feed her. So the man, every time he cooks for himself, he started to cook a little bit more. Now we're talking about something good intention so far. He'd cook a little bit more and he would bring the food and leave it on her doorstep, knock the door and leave. He doesn't want now to, to engage in conversation or anything. Just knock the door, he would leave. So he would do that for a while. Then the shaitan came to him again and he said, you know, why don't you wait until she takes the food so that no strange person sees her taking the food. They might become interested in her or they might talk to her. So then he would stay until she would take the food. So he would say something to her and so on and so forth. So what happens then? The barriers start, started to break. And this is something that happens a lot. In MSAs, it happens in the Muslim workplace. It happens even within like you find in the committees within the masjid first like I said there's a, there's a, a great distance between the man and the woman and then after a while it becomes you know they're giggling and, and joking and, and this and that because the barriers eventually break so then he starts he said you know maybe she's you know lonely and, and, and homesick so he would start to engage in, in chit chat small talk and after a while, the small talk came, became where he would go inside and he would eat. And in, as you know the story, in the end, he fell into zina with this person. And she became pregnant. And she even gave birth. So then he became afraid that he will be discovered. I and mean, he's known as the, the righteous man and the worshiper of Allah. So he killed both of them and he buried them. And after about a year and a half or so, the... The brothers returned and he told them, Allah, your sister, she fell ill and she died and this was the qadr of Allah Azza wa and she was buried and so on. So then they believed him because he was a righteous man and they went away and the shaitan kept coming to them in their dreams and kept telling them that this man killed her and he buried her in a certain place. So they went and they dug up that place and they found her buried with an infant and a child. So they knew. And they went to the Sultan, the man in charge, and he was tried and he was now tied awaiting his punishment. So while he was awaiting his punishment, the shaitan came to him in the form of a human and he said, do you know me? The man said, I don't know you. He said, I'm the one who tricked you into this from the beginning. Because see, shaitan, he doesn't come to you and say, uh, why don't you kill this person? Or why don't you perform zin? He starts with something simple. No one would fall for it if he comes and says, why don't you kill the person? So why don't you go insult him like he insulted you the other day? Or oh, now he's insulting you too much, why don't you hit him back? Or eventually it leads to that. So he comes to you with something small first. So here, the shaitan said, I'm the one who he started all this for you. And if you want out, there's one way I'll show you, you can come out of all this mess. 
and that you prostrate to me, you make one sajda to me. And this man who was a righteous man and a worshiper of Allah Azza wa Jal, he wanted to be freed from this embarrassing situation. So he made the sujood for the shaitan. And when he did that, the shaitan ran away saying, Inni Allah Rabbil Alameen. I am afraid of Allah, Lord of the worlds. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in the Quran, كَمَثَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ إِذْ قَالَ لِلْإِنسَانِ كَفُرْ فَلَمَّا كَفَرْ قَالَ إِنِّي بَرِئٌ مِنْكَ إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهَ رَبَّ الْعَالَمِينَ That the example of the shaytan, when he told to the man, he said to the man, اِكْفُرْ This, يعني, become a kafir. فَلَمَّا كَفَرْ When he became a kafir, he said, I am innocent from what you do. I am afraid of Allah. I fear Allah, the Lord of the world. So this is how the shaytan slowly brings things, and this is how when the barriers break, it starts off with something simple, something innocent, and then it eventually leads to something that is haram. So what we want to say is that it is unnatural and unrealistic to assume that, there is, that nothing will happen between men and women. Because Allah Azza wa has put a natural tension between men and women. So to say that we can be friends and it can be an innocent relationship, it's really unrealistic. The Prophet ﷺ told us in Bukhari, I'm not leaving behind any fitna, meaning any temptation, more, or more harmful to men than women. So no temptation is stronger for the man than a woman. So how can you have a hadith like this that tells you there's nothing, no stronger temptation, and then you say, well, we can be friends and nothing will happen. It's unrealistic to expect that. And uh, uh, one Muslim man came to me one time, he said, I have female Muslim friends. And one time we spent the night in a room studying. And wallahi, nothing happened. And we didn't even think of anything. I studied and she studied and, and she like late AM, she left and I remained and nothing happened. So he's asking, so why is it then prohibited between men and women to be, to be together in close proximity? And of course the answer is very simple. And if because it happened to, in your case, nothing bad happened, it doesn't mean you should make it permissible for everyone else. This is a specific case. You don't go from the specific to the general, you go from the general to the specific. So, it's not natural to, accept, to ex expect that you can be friends with a woman and nothing will happen. That may, be, that may happen in one or two different scenarios, but do we make that a general rule for people? Do we say, oh, brother so-and-so, nothing happened, he spent the night, so everybody go ahead, spend the night. We don't do that. طيب. Uh, the other thing is that you find that the, uh, the Prophet ﷺ separated physically between the men and the women. Contemplate that the women, men and women are separated in the masjid. So then what about besides the masjid? And if you're not going to intermingle in the masjid and no one really is going to take their, you know, their leisure and their time in, in sweet talking a, a woman in a masjid, يعني, even the, the person of, of weak iman. So that if, if the best of the men, the sahaba, and the best of the women were not allowed to mix in the best of the places, the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, how can we then say, well, we have pure hearts and good intentions and we're not going to, it's okay if we do it. We have the, in, in Bukhari, the hadith of Umm Salam radiallahu anha. She described that the Prophet ﷺ would say the salam twice after the salah, and then the woman would leave and he would stay a while. So Ibn Shahab says that he thought that the Prophet ﷺ would wait a while in order for the woman to be able to leave the masjid. This is just leaving the masjid. He doesn't want them to meet with the men while they're leaving. The best of men, the best of women in the best of places, yet the Prophet ﷺ is being so careful. In, uh, in the, the book of Abu Dawood, he has a chapter entitled In Suraf al Nisa Qabl al Rijal Min al Salah, that the departure of women before men after, after Salah. So Ibn Umar, the Prophet narrates, يعني, to, and this narration comes from Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma. He says, the Prophet said, pointed to a door in the masjid. He said, we should leave this door for women, that women only come and leave from this door. So Nafi' says that until Ibn Umar died, he never once came or went through for the, this door of the masjid. Look at how the companions took to the order of the Prophet he never once said, well, there are, no, there are no women, oh, it's late night, there's no women right now, I can leave from it. Never once did he enter from that door or leave from that door, because the Prophet ﷺ gave that command. Look at this description about the rows of the men and women. The Prophet ﷺ says, and this is in the book of Muslim, the best of the men's rows is the first row, and the worst is the last row. 
And the best of the women's rows is the last row. This is the best for the women is the last row, and the worst is the first. Why? Because the first row of the women and the last row of the, of the men, those are the two closest rows to each other. And this is in Salah, people. This is in the Masjid. And these are the worst rows because of the proximity. In another hadith narrated by Abu Dawood, the Prophet ﷺ says, give way to the women. He says, give way means when you're walking on the roads. Because he saw the men and women when they leave the masjid, they walk on the road meet together, meaning that there's, uh, there's a man here in the middle of the road, a few steps back there's a woman in the middle of the road, and they're all walking home. No one's talking to anyone. The Prophet ﷺ then says to the women, give way as it is not appropriate for you to walk in the middle of the road. So now just walking home, Prophet ﷺ decided that the women will walk to the side and the men will walk in the middle. And then the women narrate, look how they follow the commands of the Prophet ﷺ. The women narrate that women from that day on would walk so close to the wall that sometimes their dress would get caught, snagged on the wall. This is how they obeyed the Prophet ﷺ. And this is how the Prophet ﷺ separated between them even just walking home from Salah. So then the, the, the excuse of the poor, pure heart and the good intention doesn't hold and some t most of the time people when they sin, they don't have an intention to, in to anger Allah. Like the Muslim who consumes alcohol, he doesn't sit down and say, well, my intention is to anger Allah by doing this. His intention is to, whatever they call it, get a buzz, get him out of ish, all these words. So, then comes the other issue of, well, she's like a sister to me. Well, she's you know, almost a family member. The Prophet ﷺ said, beware of entering upon women. So a man asked the Prophet ﷺ, أَرَأَيْتَ الْحَمُوا He says, what about the brother-in-law? The Prophet ﷺ said, الْحَمُوا الْمَوْتْ الْحَمُوا الْمَوْتْ The brother-in-law is death. The brother-in-law is death. So what does this mean? So he's telling him, even the brother-in-law. And uh, Nawawi, Imam Nawawi rahimahullah, says that the brother-in-law also would mean all of the relatives of the husband, like the nephews of the husband, the cousin of the husband, the uncle, all of them are not to enter or to stay alone with the wife with his wife and the Prophet ﷺ saying that the brother-in-law is death it could mean that that if that it could result in religious doom if some sin happens between the two or it could mean that actual death will happen if there's a sin because adultery the result punishment is death or it could mean that the disaster will strike if the husband becomes jealous he divorces the wife or that the Prophet ﷺ is using this terminology to tell you how you should be afraid of being alone with a non-mahram or someone that you're permitted to marry that you should fear it as you fear death or that it is as terrible as death so it can't be natural and something else being alone with, with like those people who say well you know we sit we're just friends you know and we sit down we study and it's a natural relationship let me tell you something you know all, you all know this hadith the Prophet Sallallahu said really that uh, that no man sits alone with uh, a non-mahram woman except that the shaitan is the third amongst them. So those people who say it's natural, if they could visualize, if they could actually see the shaitan, would it be a natural sitting? There's a brother over here, sister in her hijab over there, and Mr. Shaitan is sitting right here. If you took a, a photograph of the three of them sitting together, shaitan is sitting there. Would it look like a natural, oh, Allah, very innocent, huh? What's shaitan doing sitting with you if it's innocent? He can't be, he can't be in a gathering and it's a nice innocent gathering. So it can't be something natural. Now then we want to move quickly, since our time is about up, to the issue of, so now we're talking about when you, when you intermingle, that's one of the things that facilitates zina, when you're alone with a woman. And being alone doesn't just happen like that, it happens when barriers start to break. We want to talk then about the gaze. The Prophet says, لا تتبع النظر النظر بالنظر فإنها بريد الزنا. The Prophet says, do not follow a glance with another glance because it's, it's like the facilitator of zina or one of the passageways, the avenues of zina. So this is the gaze and you know that you're allowed one look and then that won't be counted against you. If you look again, it's counted against you. And some brothers try to be smart so they take one long look. <laughs> The whole idea of the look is that now you know there's a woman there, you turn away. So if you keep looking, you still know there's a woman there, you can't keep looking. And this also, by the way, lowering the gaze can also apply to women, especially if they feel that there is, um, 
يعني فتنة or some emotions will be stirred then the woman has to lower her gaze as well uh, you know a lot of times people who look at women a lot they always tell you the same thing they think they're smart they're trying to be uh, funny and uh, they tell you that inna Allah jamilun yuhibbul jamal so we're looking at the beauty of women Allah is beautiful and he loves beauty so then the comeback is that you know I understand because Allah is beautiful he loves beauty why do you love it? Okay. <laughs> so I wanted to uh, okay. so I wanted to then quickly take, uh, just talk about uh, lowering the gaze I want to take the example of one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. his name was Thalaba ibn Abdul Rahman he was a young man about the age of 16 and he used to always run errands for the Prophet ﷺ. he would send him here and he would send him there to do something for him so one day the Prophet ﷺ sent him to do something and he was walking through the city of Medina and he passed by a house with an open door. So he glanced inside and he saw a type of curtain that they used to cover the shower area. And the wind blew that curtain and he saw a woman, a Muslim woman inside that was bathing. And it's as if he glanced for too long or and he, and he looked for a bit too long until he saw something and then he came to his senses. So he was overtaken by an extreme feeling of guilt and hypocrisy. And he said to himself, A'udhu Billah, the Prophet, how can I be of, of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu and one who is close to him, who runs his errands and be so horrible as to disrespect the people's privacy. So then he says, I respect, disrespect the aura of the Muslims, Allah, Wallahi, Allah is going to send ayat and reveal and mention me with the hypocrites. So he feared to return to the Prophet who would tell him that he is a hypocrite. So he ran away out of fear. He ran away. So the Prophet waited for him for hours and he waited from one prayer to the next. And then he started to ask about him as the days went by. And then the Prophet would ask, the, have you seen Thalaba? And then days passed, so he sent Umar ibn Khattab and Salman al-Farisi to go look for him in the streets of Medina. So they came back, they said, O Prophet of Allah, we searched for him in the roads, the markets, and the meadows, and we couldn't find him. Perhaps he'll come back. So the Prophet ﷺ waited. And then after a while again, he said, Ya Umar, Ya Salman, go and look for him in the outskirts of Medina. So they went and they came to a set of mountains between Mecca and Medina, where some nomads were herding their goats. So they were, they, the, the nomads saw that they were looking for something. So they asked them, are you looking for something? They said, we're looking for a boy. His description is this and that. So they said, perhaps you're looking for al-fata al-bakka. Perhaps you're looking for the young man who's always crying. Umar says, I don't know about that. But we're looking for a boy who's this tall and this is his complexion. And he looks like this and that. So then, but what about this young boy you're talking about? And he says, on the other side of this mountain is a young man who for 40 days we hear nothing from him but crying and istighfar. So Umar asked, when does he come down? He said, they, they said he comes down when the sun sets. He comes to us. We give him a little bit of milk. So he drinks it while he's mixing his tears with it. Meaning while he's drinking, he's still crying. And then he goes up to the mountain again while he's crying. So then Umar says, how can we see him? He says, when the sun sets. So Umar hid and Salman radiallahu anhu, they hid. And when the sun set, Thalab ibn Abdurrahman radiallahu anhu came down looking sad and dejected, his head lowered, the tears running down his face and he has lost a lot of weight. So he came to the A'rab and they gave him some milk. So he takes it to bring it to his mouth and he begins to cry so much that he couldn't drink. And then finally he drinks what he could and he turns to go back to the mountain. So then Umar and Salman radiallahu anhu came to him. And when he saw them, he was so scared. He says, what do you want from me? They said, the Prophet ﷺ wants you. He says, what does he want from me? They said, I don't know. He says, did Allah reveal ayat about me? They said, we don't know. Has Allah mentioned me with the hypocrites? They said, we don't know. He says, people, please do not embarrass me and leave me to die alone on the side of this mountain. So they said, wallahi, we won't leave you. So he struggled, but they took him back to Medina. And they took him to his home. And he was crying harder than ever. So then Umar went and told the Prophet ﷺ, we found Thalaba ibn Abdurrahman. He said, where did you find him? He said, we found him on the side of a mountain. And he's at home, now you can visit him if you like. 
So the Prophet ﷺ went and entered upon him. And when he saw the Prophet ﷺ, he was so scared and he screamed out, Ya Rasulullah, Anzal Allahu fiya ayat. Has Allah revealed ayat about me? Prophet ﷺ said, Kalla. He said, No. Has Allah mentioned me with the hypocrites? Prophet ﷺ said, No. So then he cried. He increased in crying. And the Prophet ﷺ sat near him. And he took his head and he put it on his blessed thigh. Sallallahu so then Tha'laba cried and he said, O Prophet of Allah, remove a head that is full of sins and transgression from your thigh. I am lesser and not deserving. And the Prophet ﷺ said, No. So then the Prophet ﷺ asked him, he said, Ya Tha'laba, ma tarju ya Tha'laba, what do you wish for? And he said, I wish for the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he asked him, then what are you afraid of? He says, I am afraid of the punishment of Allah. And he says, وَمَاذَا تَتَمَنَّى And what do you hope, what do you wish for? He says, أَتَمَنَّى That I wish for the forgiveness of Allah Azza wa Jal. So the Prophet ﷺ then made dua for him while he's crying, saying, أَسْتَغْفِرْ لِي يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ Ask forgiveness for me, O Prophet of Allah. Suddenly, Tha'laba radiallahu anhu, he jolted, he shook. So the Prophet ﷺ, he says to the Prophet ﷺ, I feel as though ants are walking between my flesh and my bones. Like something is walking between my flesh and bones. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Do you feel that? He said, yes. He says, that is death. It is coming to you. So then he kept saying the jihada, Astaghfirullah, la ilaha illallah, until the soul left his body. So then when he died, the Prophet ﷺ washed him and covered him and led the prayer over him. And while they were carrying him to the cemetery, the Prophet ﷺ was walking behind his body, but he was walking on the tip of his toes as if it were very, very crowded. So then Umar says to him, Ya Rasulullah, Tamshi ala atrafi qadamayk, wal nasu qad awsa'u lak. You're walking on the tip of your toes, but the people have given you a lot of room. So he says, Ya Umar, Waihaka ya Umar, may Allah have mercy on you, Umar. Wallahi, I do not find a place to put my foot because of how the angels are crowding me over him. Brothers and sisters in Islam, Anas radiallahu anhu said that, to, he says to the generation after the companions, you imagine certain sins to be more insignificant than a straw. Something like a, a straw, which is very insignificant. But at the time of the Prophet wasallam, we used to count them among those things that can destroy a man. And in this story, Tha'laba ibn Abdurrahman radiallahu anhu, he did something, he, he gazed, he took a gaze, but it became so much of a weight, that sin, and this is something that so many people have taken for granted, looking at images of women in magazines, on television, on the internet. And see, people have become so used to it that they don't even think about it. How many people think of lowering their gaze from the newscaster? Do you look at the news? They watch the news. You're watching the news. But there's a, there's a woman who has a lot of makeup and you're looking at her the whole time. People don't even remember to lower their gaze. Ibn Mas'ud said a believer treats a sin as if it were a mountain over his head that may fall on him any moment, where a regular sinner looks at them like a fly that sat on his nose and he waved it away with his hand. The believer, the, way, the sin is like a mountain that's going to fall on you any minute. But for the person who sins normally, sits on your nose, you go like this and it's gone. And that's why then, lowering the gaze, things like that, the people have become so used to looking at things that are haram. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, Beware of minor sins, for they add on until they destroy a man. I'll, I'll conclude in the next few minutes. We just want to talk about <coughs> lowering the gaze. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُضُّ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ وَيَحْفَظُوا فُرُوجَهُمْ ذَلِكَ أَزْكَى لَهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا يَصْنَعُونَ Allah Azza wa says concerning lowering the gaze, and look at the connection here. Say to the, living, to the believing men, they should lower their gaze and guide their private parts. That will make for greater purity for them. Look at how Allah connects lowering the gaze and then guarding the private parts. Because that is conducive to something happening. Lowering the gaze will, is conducive to you guarding your private parts. And the, just quickly about lowering the gaze, that... Uh, first of all, uh, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Qayyim al-Jawziyah, he comments about lowering the gaze. He says the first thing, it is something commanded in the Qur'an. The second is that it frees your heart from regret. 
So when you keep looking at things that you can't have, and if a, if a man keeps looking at beautiful women, they keep having this regret that they cannot have a wife. Of, of, even the pe people who are married who keep looking, they start to feel regret. And they start to see what they have as lesser than what they see in the magazine. Lowering the gaze, give, gaze gives the heart strength. And it leads to a happiness that's greater than the happiness of looking. So when people look at something or that's haram, they, they feel this kind of... Uh, يعني, uh, ish, uh, some pleasure. But when you don't look, you get greater pleasure because you obeyed Allah Azza wa Jalla in that. And it also closes a door. Lowering the gaze closes a door to the hellfire. Because you know the hellfire is surrounded with desires. And of course of the remedies are to get married and to fast. And, and I'm, I know I'm abbreviating Annie, because of the brevity of time. But to get married, the cures, and to fast. And to look down. So some, it's unrealistic to expect you to lower your gaze or to not look at women if you're walking around always looking up. So you're going to catch a glimpse here and a glimpse there and a glimpse might be a little bit too long. So you look down. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud had a neighbor for many years who used to always lower his gaze while he's walking. He doesn't want his eye to catch something that's haram. So he used to walk while he's looking down. So brothers, try that. While you walk, keep looking down. And Ibn Mas'ud had a servant girl. When he used to come and knock the house, knock on the door, she would open. He's always looking down so as not to glance something into the house of his brother. And the servant girl for so many years, for nine years he was a neighbor, she thought he was blind because he never looked up. And she would come to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and say, your blind friend is here. And he would laugh because the man is not blind. But out of this modesty, he's always looking down. Um, I, uh, I think I've, I've, went, I've gone way over the, the, time, the allotted time anyways. So that I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who lower their gaze and who are re repentant and feel the weight of their bad deeds. And we ask Him to, forget, to forgive our sins and to reward us with paradise.